this is one of the very interesting saints that we have in the Holy Mother, the Church. But also, before to speak about the saint, let us also speak about the person. Because he's part of the human being, and probably many of our audience, including ourselves, probably can relate or connect it with the previous conversion way from St. Augustine. Right. So St. Augustine is, um, in some ways, he's very hard because much like St. Thomas Aquinas, um, he's simply the kind of character that totally apart from the church only shows up every hundred years or so. He, he's, he's just a scoping kind of a character, extraordinarily bright, extremely competent, very gifted at the right time and the right places in church history and world history. Um, he's simply one of the most important people in the fourth and fifth centuries. And, and as a result, he can, he can be kind of overwhelming to try and look at, but the truth of his story is that Augustine was, um, was, a, a, a bright kid without too much money, um, who got himself into serious trouble with his creditors and had to leave town who, uh, shacked up with his college girlfriend and got her pregnant, uh, largely to anger his mother. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and who um, wound up uh, having um, a sort of a series of unhappy love affairs that ultimately culminated in him joining a cult, which made him extremely unhappy. Um, and that's what led him to the Catholic Church. Like those are real broad swaths, but that is, that, 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 that is in large part Augustine's story. From the time that he enters the Catholic Church, everything changes and he comes alive in a way that he wasn't alive before. Could be a simplistic w question. But why our Lord looking for this kind of people to show his mercy and love? I think, um, you know, the, 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 the church is full of different kinds of people. Some tend to sanctity and piety very naturally. Others have to be taught over a longer period of time. Some have made big messes of their lives and turned things around. Others have never made any mess at all. Um, and, and both are important because both personality types are, 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 are real. And, and part of the human being. Part of the human condition. And so I think the mistake that we often make about St. Augustine is, is, is the way we tell his story. It often looks like, um, I don't know, he went to college and became kind of a frat boy and then afterwards had some kind of a conversion. And I don't think that's a fair assessment of his life story. I think it's more like um, a tragic love story. And when, when, when his first love didn't pan out the way that he'd hoped, he had to learn to deal with disappointment. Um, one of the great tragedies of Augustine's life is that, is, is, is that this woman that he loved very deeply, whom he could not marry, and scholars are unsure as to what this is about, probably she was a slave, and Freeman couldn't marry slaves. It was illegal, but it's not clear. For whatever reason, she was deemed an unsuitable mate, and this is before he was a Christian, so it couldn't be that she was a pagan, right? Um, but his mother was absolutely opposed to the match, and so... Um, so he can't marry the love of his life. They wind up having a baby. So he winds up with the baby. He can't even bring himself later on to write down her name. Wow. He's so heartbroken over it. He can't even bring himself to write down her name. He also, it seems, never tells us the true name of his son. He refers to his son by a name, but the name is a neologism. It's a, it's a, it's a made up name. Adeodatus, which is very, very telling. Very, very important, especially for any listeners who themselves or their children wind up pregnant out of wedlock and they're feeling ashamed or embarrassed about it. Augustine names the son whom he had out of wedlock the gift of God. Not the curse or the fruit of my sin or something like that. The gift of God. And he recognizes his son as the greatest gift that God has given him. And it's really his son that purifies the love he has first for this other woman and then ultimately for God. And so uh, shortly after his conversion, he loses both his son and his mother, St. Monica, and has to figure out what life is going to look like now if Jesus really is the center. Jesus really is the one. His father was a pagan. His mother, Santa Monica, is still unbaptized and building for knowledge. He came under the influences of the Manichaeans, which caused his mother intense sorrow. He left Africa for Rome, deceiving his mother, who was ever anxious to be near him. She prayed and wept. A bishop consoled her by observing that a son of so many tears will be, never be lost. 
yet that evil spirit drove him constantly deeper into moral degeneracy, capitalizing on his leaning toward pride and stubbornness. Grace was playing a wedding game. There still was time at the greater the depths into which the evil spirit plunged it is flagging. The stronger will be the reaction. So uh, I will admit here, wow. uh, as I say this, um, that I, I had a somewhat difficult relationship with my mother and, and, <laughs> and, pe and people that know me and, wow. and knew my mom know that. So this is not a surprise for anybody. Um, so, I, so I'm saying that because it could sound like I'm doing a massive amount of projection here, but I don't think I am. I, I, I actually think that the tradition has done a lot of projection and I'm trying to clear it up and to the church, but to give his whole life in a way that very few ever have to the person of the Lord Jesus. We'll see what he, what he said to the church and what is the amazing legacy for us. Iowa Catholic Radio, be not afraid. I don't think men have ever been as lonely as they are today. And it's easy to get depressed about it. Where are the kind of guys I hung out with in college? Everybody's too busy. No one makes time for one another. Workplaces and neighborhoods, they're just too transient to form meaningful connections. You know what? Maybe that's all true. But if you really want to know what the problem is, look in the mirror. Instead of whining, you need to become the change you want to see in the world by becoming the kind of friend you wish you had. Think of the qualities of your ideal friend. Seriously, think of a list of what that person would look like. Now, you ready for this? Go and be that friend to somebody. But to who? This person has this flaw, that person has that flaw. <laughs> Stop that. Be the friend you wish you had, and I promise you, you'll form the friendships you've been missing. The world is a lonely place. You have the power to fix that. This is Chris Stefanik. For more of our men's program, visit reallifecatholic.com. Support for Iowa Catholic Radio provided by Mercy College of Health Sciences, where you can chart your course for more. Mercy College provides unparalleled clinical rotations, hands-on learning, accelerated education, and flexible schedules. Since 1899, Mercy College has been transforming students into healthcare professionals. Guided by Catholic values, our faculty put classroom theory into practice. Students are prepared for roles in service and leadership throughout their own careers. Learn more at mchs.edu. Mercy College of Health Sciences. mchs.edu. Welcome back to Being Afraid, Iowa Catholic Radio. Father PJ, what is the meaning of the word rule in the monastic life? Right. So, so, so rule or regula um, doesn't mean um, like yardstick qu quite the way we imagine it now. Um, it's, uh, it, 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 it's, it is rather that which binds together. Now, you can measure with it because of, of, of how it, it's tied together. But so what rules do is they tie people together uh, on a common mission. And so, 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 so rules become a, a, a kind of a genre in the early church um, uh, attached to monastic communities, but not only to monastic communities. Um, uh, t whenever communities of Christians come together to live together on purpose, they write some kind of rule of life that's meant to bind the community together and hold each other accountable. So it has that dual sense of both being brought together and a sort of a measuring stick. Um, the most famous rule in the Western church Sa is the rule of St. Benedict. St. Benedict. And most people will have heard of that. The rule of St. Benedict uh, is more or less contemporary with this, a little bit later, but, but its, its function is very different. St. Benedict is deliberately trying to take monks who have lived apart separately and put them into one big community. Augustine writes his rule for a very different purpose. After his mother and son die in Italy, Augustine returns to North Africa and, uh, and very quickly um, is decided that he should be ordained as a priest. He has a sister back in North Africa uh, that's been left sort of on the family estate, and she's gathered around herself. She likewise has, has come to the faith, and she's gathered around herself a, a number of women who live what we would think of today like sisters. And so he initially writes this rule as kind of the, the charter for a Christian sorority. Wow. Um, uh, that, that, that's going to live in the family estate. And then he winds up employing the rule himself for the priest that he's going to live with first as a priest and then ultimately as a bishop. And then this rule becomes the, the, the standard for most non-Benedictine monastic communities in the Christian West. 
It's also the way most diocesan priests lived for, for, for much of Christian history, especially those who would live at the cathedral with the bishop. So when you have canons, uh, c- uh, chapters of canons at a cathedral living under the bishop, they would have been like this. The reason I didn't know so much about it is because one of the canons living with his bishop at a cathedral was St. Dominic. Wow. And so when Dominic starts the Dominicans, he chooses the rule of St. Augustine to be that which is going to form the basis of their life. But the reason this is important, friends, and the reason I want to draw your attention to to this, if you do nothing else this week, just literally Google rule of St. Augustine. It's very short. It's not like the rule of St. Benedict where you have to buy a book and it takes you three days to get through. (laughs) You can do this in a half an hour. Um, And in fact, in the order, we used to read it out loud at dinner so that the rule would become sort of just part of our part of our brain. Right. Digesting it. Exactly. Um, what he does is he offers kind of big principles and then ideas about how to apply them, but then he leaves it up to the individual house to figure out how to do that. So the, the way the rule begins, and this, this, is, this is what I tell all the priests when they first come to live with me, because I still live this way at Christ the King. Before all things, dearly beloved, love God and your neighbor, because these were the first commandments given us. Here are the rules we lay down for your observances. Once you have been admitted to the community, the chief motivation for your sharing life together is, is to live harmoniously in the house and to have one heart and one soul seeking God. Community, a spirit of community. It's Acts chapter 2, and he's, he's, he's drawing deliberately on, on the language of, of, of St. Luke here to be of, the literal translation would be, of one heart and one mind on the way to God. And this is important for Augustine, who any of our listeners familiar with his confessions know, lived with a divided heart. Like, that's what messed him up. That's why his life in the world was such a disaster, because his heart was divided. He knew that in order to become single-hearted myself, I have to draw together with other people who are setting their hearts on the same object, which is Jesus Christ. Do not call anything your own. Possess everything in common. Your superior ought to provide each of you with food and clothing, not on an equal basis to all, because... All do not enjoy the same health, but to each one in proportion to his need. So this this is a really big deal. It's a it's an absolutely essential principle, not only of monastic life, but of the Christian life in general. Uh, today, it would go under the, 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 the name equity, like in schools and stuff. Um, but they don't understand that the concept uh, is, is this old. This is simply how Christians are supposed to live together. Not everybody has the same need, and so they shouldn't all get the same stuff. So, for example, when I lived in the order, I, of course, wear eyeglasses. And I've worn eyeglasses since I was a little boy because I have poor eyesight. Somebody else with perfect eyesight has no need of eyeglasses. So when it would come time for me to get new glasses, I would go to the superior and I would say, I need new glasses. And because I have poor eyesight, my glasses are kind of expensive. They usually cost several hundred dollars. So what he would do is he would open a drawer And in the drawer were glasses from all of the brothers that had died in the last several years. And he would give me their frames. And then I would take those frames to the glasses store and they would make me the new glasses, but to be put into the old frames because I needed the glasses, but I didn't need them for vanity's sake. I just needed them to see. And because it forced me to rely on the community. So the superior is supposed to see that the needs of those under his charge are taken care of. And the same principle is what should govern us as pastors because not all uh, have the same needs. So some parishioners need more attention. Some parishioners need, uh, need more care. Some parishioners need more correction. And if you offered each to each equally, you'd be doing a kind of violence. Those who own anything in the world should freely consent to possess everything in common in the monastery. Exactly as you describe. He's very concerned that the rich don't get proud because they're able to be humble in the monastery in a way that they weren't on the outside and that the poor don't become fat and lazy because they don't have to beg in the way that they had to outside. He, he, he really wants every it's 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 a radical kind of equality, which looks very different than the kind of equality that often we're sold today. It's very interesting, this one. Nor should they put their nose in the air because they associate with people they did not their approach in the world. So you and I, <laughs> you and I as priests have the privilege of associating with very wealthy people, uh, great benefactors to the church and to the diocese, the Lambertis and the Krauses and people like that, that we have things named after, right? Correct. Uh, so, 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 so Lambertis and Krauses both own gas stations, lots and lots of gas stations. 
my dad owned one gas station and we didn't do very well. <laughs> so like in the world, I would not dare approach either of those men on my own. I have to be able to approach them as a priest to be able to ask for, for resources for the church, but I shouldn't ever think, Oh, look, PJ's made it because he gets to hang out with the rich people now. And, and, and you know, Correct. And that's what he's trying to avoid. But on the other hand, those who enjoy some measure of worldly success ought to not do very little. Their brothers who come to, he, to this holy society from a condition of poverty. So, so, so it's, it's the same thing in reverse. Like we shouldn't be, uh, uh, we shouldn't think that we've made it. Sometimes this is a great temptation in the priesthood, especially I've leveled up socially because I'm a priest and I have an education and I have insurance or something like that. It's quite the opposite. We're given these things not for ourselves, but for the service of the gospel. And the church needs to be able to provide these things because we'll be able to be of better service to the gospel. But the moment this starts working as a counter witness, we need to let it go. Iowa Catholic Radio, be not afraid. 60 seconds with Archbishop Fulton J. Sheen. It must be understood at the beginning that the Eucharist may be considered either from the point of view of a sacrament or from the point of view of a sacrifice. In order to understand this distinction, because it is rather a technical one, we go back to the analogy of nature. Every day of your life, you partake of certain food, the products of wheat, vegetables, fish, meat. They all enter into the sustenance of your life. They nourish you, they feed you. But have you ever thought of this other side? Before they can ever nourish you, they must be submitted to some kind of sacrifice. Before they can be the sacrament of your physical life, they must die or be sacrificed. The people you know and trust are on EWTN. I know Carmelite nuns who get a call from their mother superior every June telling them where they're going to be assigned in the year ahead. And even if they know they're probably not going to be transferred, before that call, they're supposed to pack up all their belongings and wait for the phone to ring. It's an exercise in detachment from the world. We all go through that in our own ways, don't we? Maybe sometimes, you know, something becomes unstable in our current jobs, or a new opportunity opens up, or we have a financial crash that forces us to rebudget everything, or we go on a job interview, or maybe get a call from a doctor with some disturbing news. You know, even if those experiences don't pan out to be anything, and they usually don't, don't overlook their importance. That's God reminding us that, in the end, this world isn't our home. And if you get too attached to the little comforts you surround yourself with, you won't be available to God's grace and His call in your life. Stay open. This is Chris Stefanik from reallifecatholic.com. Welcome back to Be Not Afraid, Iowa Catholic Radio. Let's go to the last one rule from St. Augustine. Live then, all of you, in harmony and concord. Honor God mutually in each other. You have become his temples. So there's a, there's a, a, a visual representation of this that probably people have seen in movies or maybe in church and, and don't quite realize, right? But the, um, so... Um, from the earliest days of the church, even before the word Trinity had been created, it was the custom to bow your head or your body at the invocation of the Trinity. So uh, when the priest says, through our Lord Jesus Christ, your son, who lives and reigns with you in the union of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever, right? He bows his head at the holy name. Well, Augustine introduced the tradition in choir, in, 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 in church, of bowing, but not only at the name, but to each other. So that, so, that, so that the brothers would all bow to each other when coming in and out of their pews or in the hallway or whatever as a way to reverence the presence of God in the other. The, the harmony and concord that he talks about here is not simply the absence of conflict. He's got a whole section later about how to deal with conflict in the community, but that it's if we stay on the same page, if we're, if we're uh, synodal, if we're walking together, we've got to first face the same direction. Wow. And, that, and, that, and that that's accomplished by a common rule. So like by agreeing to live upon certain principles together and, 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 and by direction from a, a common superior. So the reason I'm raising this for our listeners today is not because I want you all to become little monastics, 
But one of the exercises I work through with most of my couples in pre-marriage counseling is I have them write a rule of life for their life together as a couple. Living together, correct. So, Because we all have this, whether we write it down or not, but we have tacit agreements about how we're going to live together in the house. Who does the dishes and who does the laundry? Who, who handles the bills and who does the shopping? Um, uh, what do we do when we're in a fight? Who sleeps where? Where do the clothes come from? Uh, what, what, what do I do when I'm angry at you? What do you do when you're angry at me? Right? All, all these kinds of things. And it's better for everybody to have at least some of these basic principles written down somewhere so that when there is a conflict or a dispute, you can point to it together and say that, like, this is what we're supposed to be doing, not whatever's happening now. We are approaching this 22nd Sunday of Ordinary Time. St. Paul, from the letter to the Romans, said in the chapter 12, verses 1 to 2, I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, your spiritual worship. Do not conform yourselves to this age, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that you might discern what is the will of God, what is good and pleasing and perfect. The word wow. of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. St. Augustine, literally, you know, the life of St. Augustine describe it. Wow. St. Augustine is said to have carried the epistles of St. Paul with him everywhere he went. Um, and so he, and he probably had almost all of it memorized by the time he, he, he wrote most of these important things. Um, uh, he understood the life of the Christian community as this sort of living sacrifice that was perfected in the celebration of the Holy Eucharist, because that's where the Lord's sacrifice is made manifest in the midst of his people, but that is enacted every day in the communities that we live in, whether they're religious communities or communities of priests or domestic families. And, and, and we all wind up doing the same if we're faithful to each other and to him. I, I love to, to use the beginning, I urge you. I mean, it's a, it's a deeply call to say, let us come back to Christ. Brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, exactly as the Lord in the main holy and unique sacrifice at the altar. Yeah, that's that. So, so, so that what's going on here, right, is that, is that, is that Paul is encouraging the members of the faithful to offer themselves as a sacrifice in imitation of Christ and to participate in Christ's own self-offering, which is what's revealed to us in the Holy Eucharist. Um, this is accomplished, so that it's very important here because the, the language um, can confuse people. This is accomplished by the transformation of the mind, which allows us to discern God's will, and that then lets us choose our will in accord with God's will. So we've got body, mind, and will all working together. And the mind and the will, the intellect and the will, are what constitute the human soul. They're, they're the faculties of soul. And so the human person consists of a body and intellect and a will and passions that sort of mediate between the body and the soul. And these things all have to be perfected. And what perfects these things? Well, faith perfects the intellect. Hope perfects the passions and charity perfects the will. In fact, St. Paul said, do not conform yourself to this age, but be transformed by that renewal of your mind. So, so he's concerned that we not simply reflexively do what people around us are doing, but that we consciously do what it is God has drawn us to do, which may be something very, very different. It's that also, I think, important that um, that when we look at living life together, whether that is as families or as couples or as individuals, community or in community, that we that that what we're constantly seeking here is God's will. You know, um, in the order uh, when I was in the Dominicans, they were very very keen on this. Assignments were not made either by a superior by himself or even a priest personnel board. The community would come together, and they would say. Father Fabian, you, you are a very gifted man. You, you're a good preacher. You're a good counselor. You have skills in several languages. You've uh, been successful in rural ministry and urban ministry. We think you would be a great fit for Saint so-and-so, right? Period. And then, but then just because the community thought so didn't mean it was a done deal, then you would have to go and pray about whether this seemed to be a movement of the Holy Spirit or whether they were understandably the confused. of the spirits. Bing, bingo. And this is why Saint Paul says... That you might discern what is the will of God, 
God's will has content. Like there's actual stuff that's attached here. And it's, it's our job, both as individuals, but especially collectively as the church, to figure out what God wants us to do. This is the best way to read uh, Pope Francis's desire for synodality, that what you're trying to do is together discern what God's asking you to do. Because any one of us by ourselves can head trip ourselves very, very easily, convince myself that this is what God wants me to do. Um, but I, I need the corrective of other Christians similarly attuned to God's grace who can tell me when I'm off my tree. And St. Paul said clear to, to you and me and obviously to our audiences, what is good and pleasing and perfect, not for me, for God. For God. And the perfection here, this is, this is probably a very helpful way to end. The perfection here isn't um, a state of perpetual flawlessness. It's a state of completion, wholeness integrity a, a, a circle is perfect because it's got 360 degrees Going not good. because not because the line is without smudges um, and, and that is precisely what accomplishes the common good could you please send us with your blessing father may the passion of the lord jesus and the merits and prayers of the blessed virgin saint joseph our father in faith saint augustine and all the saints grant that whatever good you do or suffering you endure heal you all your sins help you grow in holiness and bring you to everlasting life the father the son and the Holy Spirit. Be not afraid, Iowa Catholic Radio. Be not afraid. Jesus is on the way to encounter you. Go forward and be not afraid. Support for Iowa Catholic Radio and Be Not Afraid comes from Ball Team, your builder of all faith-based construction needs. Learn more at buildwithball.com. Iowa Catholic Radio would like to thank our business partner, Gold Dome Buildings. Gold Dome is locally owned and operated, serving Des Moines and surrounding areas since 1992. Builders of garages, farm buildings, customized backyard sheds, and playhouses. GoldDomeIowa.com.